I know you've got an ear out for the start of the podcast, but before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to remind you to keep an eye out for Daryl Lee's limited edition Christmas treats, because they're in stores now. Like the iconic Christmas nougat pudding, so yummy and a, and a gorgeous little gift. And some delicious Chrissy-themed twists on your favourite treats, like the Daryl Lee Rockley Road with chewy red and green jelly pieces, green and red crunchy milk chocolate balls, my favourites, and green apple and strawberry flavoured licorice. Watch them disappear. Your Christmas treats table will pop with colour and scrumptiousness. Spread some joy, bring the fun, and enjoy the Christmas tradition that is Daryl Lee. Hurry before they sell out. Daryl Lee makes Christmas better. You're listening to a DM podcast. Welcome to The Five of My Life with me, Nigel Marsh. As an author, ad man and theologian, I've always been interested in people's stories. Not just those with a high profile, but people from all walks of life, regardless of fame. Which is why I created this show. Each guest who takes the Five of My Life challenge chooses a favourite film, book, song, place and possession. They tell me their choices in advance so I can research them, but they don't tell me why they've chosen them. That's the subject of our conversation. It's amazing what you can learn when discussing someone's five choices. I hope you enjoy listening to the show as much as I enjoy making it. It never ceases to amaze me how possessions, particularly those of little or no monetary value, can evoke such powerful emotions and stories. I hope you enjoy this special compilation episode where five of my guests talk about what their chosen possession means to them. Joe Stanley is a much-loved media personality, comedian and film producer. Her creative response to the possession choice speaks to a special experience that all parents will recognise. It's not really traditionally a possession. You've messed with the format, you creative (laughs) types. Um, It's a tattoo Uh, on your left hand. um, Can you see there are five dots? I can actually, yeah. Yeah. They look like, I mean, it could look like I've had a bit of an accident with a biro. That's kind of the size of the dots. Although it took the tattoo artist quite some precision to do that. I was impressed in the end with her artistry. So Um, tell us the story. Well, and might I say I don't really relate much to possessions, hence I found this really hard and I landed in the end on this and I'm sorry to mess with the format, <laughs> but you did get a creative in. And uh, one thing of 10, 12 years on Breakfast Radio, I learned never follow the rules. Um, well, those five dots represent where my daughter's fingers sat when I held her hand, when I was walking with her, when she was about um, she, uh, six years old. Oh. I know. Stop it. <laughs> it, really uh, makes, uh, uh, uh. it makes me well up every time I think about it. So, yeah, I, I just um, put a little mark. I held her because so my favorite thing in the world is to walk. She's 11 now and still she wants to walk down the street wherever we go with her hand in my hand. And um, just her hand in my hand is a really, to me, it's a real gift that I get to have her hand in my hand. And um, I get to look down and see those dots and know that even when I don't have her hand in my hand, it is in my hand. <laughs> and, um, yeah, because she's, um, she's just a miracle to me. I, I have to say, I love the time of parenting, the era where they have to reach up to hold your hand, mm. l- l- like sort of Mowgli in the jungle. But, yeah, I, I, yeah. <laughs> it's just, your hand is down, their hand is up. They've yes. got the big, the two big hat, the two big school bag, <laughs> and it's one of my favourite memory. What a sweet idea for a, a tattoo that it's like sort of a. I, I've got the thing in our house of their their footprints fra- yes. framed, uh, yes. but but I've never heard of anyone having the, the the tattoo like you. And is it Willow, your daughter's name? Yes, yes. So you know, you when you talk about that age where they have to reach up, I mean that's quite a that's a practical thing too because they're always falling over. So the amount of times when they trip because they're, their hand in your hand, they you know they kind of don't face plant but um yeah it's a very um for me so that's about four right that age and I remember because I was four when my dad died and I remember and this is the other significance I guess of this tattoo I remember walking with her and thinking ah oh, this this might have been what it would have been like when I walked with my dad and 
sort of, it was very healing for me to imagine that, of course, he would have, he would have done that as any other father does to me. And it felt like, yes, it existed. That relationship existed, even though I have no memory of it. Um, and so, yeah, in every year of Willow growing has been quite healing for me as far as having that loss of someone that you never actually knew. That's such a wonderful fifth choice and two like, amazing stories. Well, so so my, my, I mean, God, call me easily, please, but I think some of my happiest times on this planet have been walking my kids to school. Yes. That's, I mean, you know, not, not, you know, not that I've climbed Everest, but as in, I, you know, I've done a couple of things that, that externally got attention. They don't get on the first page of things that are my happiest moments. It's walking my kids to primary school. It's true. And this is where, where the, your hand in my hand kind of, that where the, actually the tattoo came to mind for me was that I don't ever want to not have that morning routine of walking to school with her hand in my hand. And we chat away and now she's 11 and she is entitled to walk on her own, like we're very close to the school. And still we walk together and uh, I'm going to be really sad when that stops. And she is too. Uh, but, you know, she's, I'd say, a year away from screaming I hate you and slamming a door in my face. Like I'm fully prepared for that stage and um, I'll, I'll just take myself off with my, my tattoo and I remind can... myself that she does love me. But there's, a, um, there's a quote, Paula Yates, poor love, uh, gave an interview and said she never, ever forgot when her daughter brought her nose, nose to nose with mm. her and said, you don't own me. Bum wipe. Oh, wow. <laughs> you think, Great. Thanks for that. I, you know, <laughs> 15 you, years of my life to bring you up and I'm a bum wipe. Great. Bum wipe is quite the slap <laughs> in the face. But you know what? Her daughter's right. <laughs> and and I, I, I'm I very, I think maybe uh, it's a slight reaction to the way I was raised, I guess, that I, I'm, I'm a very positive psychology kind of parent and I wait for her to teach me who she is and I don't own her. Like I feel like I've spent my entire 11 years with her just inviting her and empowering her to be the person she is so that if she chooses to be a stand-up comic, she will be able to stand on the stage and know that she is enough and everybody else can go get fucked if they don't <laughs> laugh because her <laughs> mother has told her her whole life that she is enough. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> it's been so gorgeous, gorgeous to get to know you and talk to you. Thank you for sharing your five. I'm going to come to the six traditional question. Oh, I would like. I've not prepared anything. Yeah, that's the whole point. Oh no! <laughs> um, so, who would you like to hear on Five of My Life next, and why? Oh. And before you say, it, is we go round and we call these people. So, so Gillard chose Tim Minchin, Richard Glover chose Julia Gillard. Blah blah blah. So, all right. I, I would love to hear um, Bruce Pascoe, who wrote Dark Emu. Ah, I think. Um, yeah. Okay, so largely I think he's a fascinating man. That book is incredibly important. But I also think we don't hear enough Indigenous stories and we don't hear enough, um, you know, their, their culture and, and, and it's the only way we're going to find true reconciliation is to hear more of that. Todd Sampson is, amongst other things, a much-loved Gruen transfer star, an adventurer, and an award-winning documentary maker. His choice leads to the wonderful story of his life-affirming encounter with Sir Edmund Hillary. Now, your uh, possession um, is the autobiography of Edmund Hillary, and it's quite a nice sort of closing of the loop, because I can't think of anyone who embodies some of the traits that are clearly close to your heart more beautifully i mean his his life i mean researching him for this conversation you know i think of him as a bloke that climbed everest and you go well <laughs> that's one of the things that he did uh, and your possession that you're going to talk to us about is is it um view from the summit or another one he did the the, the autobiography it's it's ed hillary it's his yeah, another autobiography. Another one. but but it's a signed copy yeah so, so please tell us yeah. about the book but also the story of, of how you got a signed copy yeah so i i'd always been a fan when i was younger i was a fan of him because he had climbed mount everest and I, as a kid i was always like a little mini adventurer i used to when i was young i'd put my backpack on and go off into the woods or into the snow or whatever it would be i was always so i admired adventurers that traveled the world and i always 
wished I could be an adventurer, you know, like a Christopher Columbus and explore places that haven't been seen before, or, or an Ed Hillary, who went on one of the toughest, hardest journeys to go somewhere where no one else has been before. So I'd always admired him. And when I was young, it was because he was a mountaineer. But as I got older, I admired him because he was a beekeeper. <laughs> because he, it didn't change him. It didn't change who he was. It was He was one of the most famous people on the planet, but he was a beekeeper. He was a down-to-earth, lovely, straight-talking, big, strong Kiwi. That's yeah. what he was. And I love that about him. He never became a celebrity. He never became any of that. And then one day... Uh, we were working together and I was going to New Zealand for work. I was doing a job with the Australian Tourism Commission and I arrived in Auckland. It was two weeks before my attempt to climb Mount Everest, right? So two yeah. weeks out. And I fly into Auckland and I remember I was speaking to the cab driver about mountaineering and he was telling me that his son was a, cli- was a yeah. mountaineer and all that stuff yeah. and I was into the conversation with him and he mentioned Edwin Hillary and he said, you know Edwin Hillary lives in Auckland. Now, I knew he lived, I knew he's a Kiwi, I, I don't, I'm not stalking him, I didn't yeah. know exactly where he lived. So when I got out of the cab, I was staying at the Hilton Hotel, I got out of the cab and I thought, I wonder if Edmund Hillary is in the phone book. <laughs> <laughs> so I go upstairs, yeah. excited, thinking yeah. maybe he is. I go upstairs and I open up the white pages and right. sure enough, in bold, Sir Edmund Hillary. Brilliant. So 22 Acacia Avenue. So <laughs> what do you do? I nervously phone him. Yeah. So his wife, June, answers the phone. And I said, look, my name is Todd Sampson. I'm about to go climb Mount Everest <laughs> in two weeks. I was wondering if I could have a word with Sir Ed. <laughs> and then over a muzzled phone, right? Yeah. I could hear her going... Ed, Ed, there's a climber on the phone. What's that word with you? He's got no idea who I am. I'm not on television. I haven't done anything on television at this stage. I'm a complete stranger. So he he gets on the phone. He introduces himself. We talk, might be two or three minutes. Then he says, if you'd like to pop around for tea, I'll be here for the next three hours. So you jump in the cab. So I call the Australian Tourism yeah. Bureau, who I'm there to meet. That's yeah. the whole purpose of the trip. Yeah. And I said, look, I've just been invited for tea with Sir Edmund Hillary. Do you mind if I'm a bit late? And they were like, never mind us. Just go see him. Yeah. So I dash downstairs with the address. I give it to the cab driver. And the cab driver says, do you know who lives there? And I said, yeah. He goes, that's Edmund Hillary's house. I said, yes. And he said, can I wait out in front? <laughs> I was like, no, mate. There's enough stalking going on here. So I, I get in the house. June answers the door. I'm nervous. She puts a big smile on her face, hand on my shoulder, and she says, Ed's in the kitchen. And I go into the kitchen, and I don't know how else to describe it. You know how sometimes you meet people that you love, yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. a disaster? I walk into the kitchen, and it was everything and more that I'd ever want from someone who was a hero to me. Right. We sat down across from each other, to the side, more beside than across, because the table was shaped in a round shape. And June puts biscuits on the table, cracks open some milk, <laughs> pats me on the back and says, enjoy yourself and walks away. Yeah. And I sit there just talking completely normally without any pretense, without any celebrity, without anything, yeah. just talking about him, his life, Tenzing and the summit. And it's so Kiwi, isn't it? It's so Kiwi that one of the most famous people on the planet would be in the white pages. Yeah. Oh, it's gorgeous. And, and it, it's 10 years since he passed, isn't it? I think he passed in 2008. Yeah. And that's one of my life regrets. Mm. So when I came down, my own insecurity, I just thought I'd interrupted him enough, you mm. know? And, and I thought that I had already crossed the line. Yeah. And I didn't want to do it again. And I didn't send him a photo from the summit. And then he died. And then I wrote this story that I'm telling you in the Sydney Morning Herald and his family reached out to me oh, to right. say thank you. Is June still with us? Or? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh. So, uh, to wrap up, I'm going to ask you, who would you like to hear on Five of My Life next? Uh, I've got two that I wouldn't mind hearing from. Craig McLaughlin. Right. Or, and or, Don Burke. Wow. Because I think you <laughs> would be an interesting person to sit across from uh, from two people that probably don't want to talk uh, and two people that we should hear from. John Eales is one of the most successful rugby players and captains the world has ever seen. His choice leads to a gorgeous, touching and uplifting story about his beloved grandmother.
Now, which uh, brings me to your um, your possession, which I can't wait to hear about. And and like most of the people that come on the Five of My Life, is you've chosen something that has no monetary value. So so I'm, I'm really glad that people don't come on and say my Ferrari or my Aston <laughs> Martin or my yacht. They say the picture of my granny yeah. wearing a Wallaby shirt. Yeah. So so tell tell me about it. So my my grandmother, she's Italian, and look, she she passed away in two thousand, but. Um, she came to Australia when she was 21 years old in 1924 and was a huge influence on my life. She, Mum and Dad got married uh, and, and they mo- set up their own house. Within six months, my grandmother and grandfather w- have moved in with them. Right. So Dad you know, had all his married life with, with his, his parents-in-law living in the house. But, you know, he was a very patient guy, <laughs> um, but they were great people. Yeah. And Nono and Nono, as we, as we called them, but uh, Nono passed away when I was... Um, he was about 10 or plus years older than my grandmother and he was in Australia and went back to find a wife. Right. Um, basically because he couldn't find a wife in Australia. So yeah. went back, picked up my grandmother, you know, within three weeks they're married. Within six weeks she's on a boat on the way to Australia. Right. So she was 21 years of age in 1924. She died a week short of her 97th birthday, went back to Italy once in all that time. Wow. And basically lived with us from before I was born. So we're very so close. in the same house as you? Mm. Wow, okay. Yeah. And so we had a very close relationship. It was, it was almost like having two mums in, sure. you know, to a large uh, degree. And like I was incredibly fortunate that, yeah. you know, to have such, you know, love in the house. Yeah. And, um, and you know, she had a great work ethic. Uh, yeah, she had a great soul. And, um, and she had a great sense of humour a lot of the time as well. And I, I would often try, you know, just, and she was less than five foot tall. Right. Which is in stark contrast to myself. But I would often try to um, get her to put on one of, one of my wallaby jerseys. I wanted to get a photo and send it to a couple of people. And she refused to. She never would. Right. She, she actually, she loved the fact I was playing for Australia. Um, she wouldn't have cared in what it was. Yeah. She had no idea what rugby was. I don't think she ever watched a game. <laughs> She she couldn't watch games. You know, she'd get too nervous. When are you going to get a um, proper job, John? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. And, uh, and and in her eyes, the only proper job was being a doctor as well right. yeah. or a lawyer. You know, the, maybe those those two traditional jobs. But um, yeah, so I never got to put this jersey on. But then one Sunday morning, she came home from mass and whatever reason, I said, "No, no, I'm, I'm going to. You know, I want I want you to put the jersey on." And she said, "No, no, no, no." And she, I said, "No, no, I do." And and for whatever reason. This one day right. was the only time she ever weakened. And so I thought, I'm going to keep going here. So I got the jersey on her. You know, she was doing her hair or getting it all right. I got the jersey on her. I got my shorts on her and the jersey's <laughs> coming through the bottom of the shorts. And I got my socks on her. And so I got her out in the front yard. I thought, I'm not going to miss this opportunity. And in those days, you had to then find a camera and have film on yep. it. And uh, there was no such thing as camera in your phone. And... Uh, Got her out into the front yard and took a series of photos, including some where she's holding a footy, others where she's holding a forex. Oh, gorgeous! You know, who, who were the sponsors gorgeous. at the time? It was, yeah. So it, uh, yeah, it's a it's a series of photos that sits on my desk at home. And, oh, right. Uh, so, so one of those framed ones. Yeah, yeah. And look, I mean, she met a lot of a lot of my teammates over the years, and everyone loved her. And she she died. The week before we played South Africa in 2000, and it was probably, you know, now Australia and South Africa play for the Mandela Plate. I think it was mm. the first time that was played for in a test in Melbourne. And she died early early in the week, so I uh, didn't go down straight away and um, you know, stayed up for a couple of days just with the family and then went down. And, and I remember going out to play that game and... And then I saw before the game a lot of my teammates, all my teammates were putting the Aww. black armbands on. Yeah. And uh, George Gregan was the vice captain. He said, mate, this is for Nonna. And look, I mean, in, in all the time that I was playing, I'd say that would have been one of the most emotional moments for me in a Wallaby jersey. And it's, you know, just how your teammates, you know, she was so important. It was, it was her time, like 90, yeah. almost 97. Yeah. Yeah, you don't... You're sad, but you're really. It's more about the celebration of her mm. life. But but it's this momentous occasion of someone really important to you moving on, passing away, and the acknowledgement of that from my teammates was something I'll never forget. What a, what a lovely story. When I look around my house at the difference in how people of our generation 
treat photos and framed photos than to our kids. So, so they you know, I look look back to my parents where certain photos make it into the silver frame, yeah, and then they become hugely disproportionate in your view of your great grandfather that you never met because the one photo that you've seen of him is him wearing a naval uniform. Yeah. Right, right, <laughs> but but that, that, that might have no genuine representation of his character, but you go, but that's what yeah. I see every day of my 18 years that I'm growing up mm. and whatever else. So I, I quite like the process of honouring an image. So, so I, I, I think, personally, frames are going to come back in. Mm. I don't want 6,000 photos on my mm. bloody iPhone. I want a few that really mean... I've, I've got a picture of my wife and my kids at a certain time where they were all at school, and it's just a snapshot in time. And you go, frame it. And, and mate, I, I have to say... I mean, I, I wish that I could talk to you for, you know, three more hours. Is you are a dead-set inspiration. You, you really are, not just on the sporting field, but just in life generally, um, you have one more question that you have to answer, which is, who should I get on Five My Life next? Oh, it's very interesting. I hadn't, hadn't, uh, hadn't thought about that. Um, I mean, if you, if you could go international. Yes, de- like, most definitely. Like, I reckon that getting someone like a, a Paul Simon yep. or a, uh, a Michael Stipe from lead singer okay. of R.E.M., I, I'd, I'd love to... You know, really understand how you write a song. Dr. Amantha Imber is the CEO of Inventium and host of the number one business podcast, How I Work. Her choice leads to a fascinating description of her time in the music industry. Uh, and you have chosen, uh, I loved researching this, you have chosen a, a guitar that is from a world-famous brand based in Melbourne, set up by Ray and Bill May. It's the guitar of choice of Neil Finn and Paul Kelly, so you're in fabulous company. Maytone 325C guitar. Why have you chosen that? So I've had this guitar since I was, I think, 16 or 17 years old. So it's the possession that I've had for the longest. And when I, you know, when I think about what would I rescue if my house was burning down, uh, like it it would be the maiden. It's kind of like, obviously. Uh, After Frankie. My (laughs) daughter. (laughs) Before or after, I don't know. Um, uh, No, no, no. But in all seriousness, if like I'm talking about material, physical possessions that are that like a a non-living or breathing, it it would be that guitar. It's, It's really the only thing that I own that I just, you know, yeah, I, I don't think I could replace easily. So I didn't realize this at the time, but the school that I went to was a very musical school. So I just thought it was incredibly normal to, you know, for every year, like from prep or grade one to be studying an instrument and, um, you know, like l- learning it, taking, you know, regular classes in it. And so I think, you know, by the age of 16 or 17, there were probably, I don't know, five or six instruments that I could play to like a grade one standard. And guitar was something, I had a few lessons in guitar, but I'm actually largely self-taught. And now while I abandoned my dreams of becoming an actor, what happened during my undergrad studies is that I I was, you know, I was was doing a bit of acting and kind of feeling a bit disillusioned with the idea of being an actor and having so much of your success be based on what you look like. And I'd actually turned to doing more writing, so more creative writing, like script writing and screenwriting. Um, and then I became frustrated with that because it's, you know, it's so hard to actually get your work performed. Uh, and then for, for whatever reason, I'm like, well, maybe I'll try songwriting. And I think at the time I had a broken heart and it seemed like just a really good therapeutic outlet to write songs. And then combined with that, I, I went on and I started, um, I was doing my honours year in psychology and that's a horrible, horrible year. Like it was, it was the hardest year. It was harder than, than, than doing my doctorate or, or PhD. Um, I was like, I was always looking for just ways to procrastinate basically from the horrible task of writing a thesis. And so I started writing songs and that kind of helped with some of the heartbreak that I was dealing with. And then, and then I think it was during my doctorate that I'm like, okay, I need like a serious procrastination thing here because the, like, the doctor, it was hard work. And so I thought, and at the same time, I think I saw an ad in the the newspaper for producers. 
And I thought, why don't I give them a call and pay for them to record some of the songs that I was writing? And and so I did that. And then I think we recorded like a, a four track demo that later turned into a 10 track album. And then like being, you know, the ridiculous type A personality that I am, I'm like, well, I've got this 10 track album. I guess I need a record label <laughs> um, <laughs> as you do. And so I got, well, I don't know if this exists anymore, but I got the Oz Music Industry Directory, which is like the yellow pages for the music industry, or at least it was. And at least like every manager, every agent, every record label, every publisher. And so I got that and I, despite being quite musical, I didn't have particularly broad musical taste in terms of what I was listening to. And I didn't know the names of many bands and artists. So I went through all the record labels in the book and I circled the ones that I knew some of the bands or artists that were on the label, because I thought, well, if, if I know them, they're probably quite a big label. And so there were about 10 labels and I thought, okay, I'll send, I'll send my, you know, 10 track demo slash album off to all these labels and see if they, you know, want to represent me. Oh, so bloody naive. I think I was 21 at the time. And, uh, and I got a few rejections back. And then I remember I was, I was driving to the car park. I was literally parking at the Monash Clayton car park and I get this phone call and the guy on the other end says, hi, it's, uh, it's John here from Roadrunner Records. And I said, hi. And he said, I've been listening to your album all morning. I've played it for everyone at the label and it's completely polarized people. People either love it or they hate it. And I know that music that polarizes is what sells. When can I meet you? <laughs> wow. Wow, wow, know. wow. This story is going to go in a surprising direction because you're talking to me and I know you're not Lady Gaga. So what? <laughs> <laughs> so what happened? So I met with John a couple of weeks later and and he's like, where have you been? Why haven't I heard of you? And I'm just, I'm like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Probably because I'm not a, a real musician. Um, and, uh, and anyway, so he's like, you know, I love this. I, I want to sign you. Um, but first I need to see you play live because we make the majority of our uh, money from artists on, you know, them touring and playing live. And so he said, so have you got a band? And I said, yes even though I didn't. Um, and he said, so you've got some gigs coming up because I'll invite the whole label down to your next gig. And I said, yeah, yeah, I've, I've got some gigs coming up in the next few weeks. And obviously I didn't because I didn't have a band. <laughs> and I said, so I'll just let you know when the next gig is. And he said, yeah, great. And I'll invite the whole label to come down. <laughs> I'm like, oh, 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 fuck. And so anyway, in the next few days, I I think I just reached out to a bunch of friends and I'm like, you know, I basically, I needed a guitar player, bass player, keys player, drummer. So I needed to find four musicians very quickly and also get a gig. And I can't remember what came first because I did get a gig. And I think it was at, um, I think it was like the Yarraville Hotel, um, random. And I, I managed to cobble together a band and we did some rehearsals. And then, you know, I said to John, oh, yeah, I've got a gig coming up. And they all came and and they're, they're like, yeah, yeah, this is this is great. Um, don't quite know about the band, but you're great. So let's like, you know, let's let's continue. And so anyway, I spent the year basically working, working with the label. Um, also got a manager as well, again, through the same the process of Oz Music Industry Directory. Do I know anyone they manage? Um, he turned out to be an alcoholic. Um, so I got a new manager and it was, it was probably one of the most miserable years of my life where I kind of, I realized a few things. Like firstly, I realized it just became so little about the actual music and it, and it really, my love of writing songs, um, sort of gradually diminished throughout the year. And I also realized that like, so I ended up getting a new band, um, which was mostly session musicians. So people that whose job it is, is, is to just play music on generally other people's albums and at gigs and things. And the musicians that I met, I mean, like 
music was literally in their blood. Like they, they could not have done any other job except music. And I felt like such a fraud because for me, music was just this hobby. Like really psychology was the main thing. Music was just a really good way to procrastinate and not write my thesis. And it was just something that I thought was a bit fun. I felt really weird about the fact that I was, I was the one with this record deal and you know, the one at the front of the band kind of pretending I knew what I was doing when the people behind me, like metaphorically and literally were the ones that really got music and had it in their blood and I didn't. And it's a really, it was a tough industry. And, and I remember having this conversation with John um, sort of towards the end of that year. And he said like, you know, <clears throat> Amantha, the expectation is that, that you'll be on tour for 11 months of the year. So you're going to have to start making some sacrifices in other areas of your life. And, and for me, that meant giving up psychology. And that was, that was the thing that, that was in my blood and I was not prepared to give up. And so at the end of that year, I ended up walking away from the deal. Wow. It's fascinating listening to you. One of our other guests on Five My Life, a chap called James Valentine. I don't know if you know him from the, the mm. ABC yeah. uh, DJ. He, he had a, actually quite a successful career as a as a rock star um and he said it took him years to recover his love of music because mm. the, the process so, so he didn't make the decision you made he did go and do the tour you know around america and whatever else and it's not all rock and roll you mm -hmm. know excuse the metonymy it, it, it's a brutal <laughs> bloody you know you can't afford your gum work and and you have to play the same sax solo every single night for 233 nights in a row. So I'm glad the world of organisational psychotherapy didn't lose you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and do you still gig? Can the Five of My Live listener base go and catch Amantha strutting her stuff or is that has the guitar been put away? God, only in my living room. So I did, I did gig quite a bit during my 20s after I walked away from the deal and it was fun. It was just gigging for fun and I was still writing quite a lot as well. I had no idea. It was literally trial and error and somehow I just kind of fluked some 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 good chord progressions and lyrics, you know, that um, you know, that people liked. But but I just I'm stunned that I was able to do it. Um, but yeah, funnily enough, like I, I love playing the guitar and singing for fun now. But what I realized when again, like in the process of leaving my marriage, is that for for the time that I was with my ex husband, we were together for about 13 years, I think, all up, I barely touched the guitar and I certainly didn't write any songs. And since being on the other side of that marriage, I, I mean, yeah, I, I would be picking up that guitar at least once a week, if not more often. Um, and it's just, it's just been so joyous to kind of bring music back into my life like that. Wow. Well, it's, it's been just a, an absolute treat for me to, to listen to your choices and the stories behind them on Five My Life, Amantha. I, I can't thank you enough for coming on and taking the format seriously. That There is one final question, which is uh, I've got to stop asking my guests uh, in a certain way because it reveals if they have or haven't listened to other episodes. Because <laughs> <laughs> the guests that go, oh, that's a surprise, clearly haven't <laughs> bloody listened. Um, <laughs> Do you know what the sixth question is? I can't remember because I have listened to your episodes <laughs> oh. before, but I haven't for like a little while. Ah, there you go. Well, it's the sixth question, which I take very seriously, and, and we follow them all up. Doesn't mean they all say yes, but lots of them do. Oh, I know what it is. I know. I just remembered. Like, who would you like to see on the show? That's exactly right. Who would you like to see on the show see, and, and why? I would say Lin-Manuel Miranda. So I know that it's really trendy to like Hamilton, and so he's the guy that created Hamilton. Um, but I liked it when it wasn't as trendy. I just need to put that out there. So I think in 2017, so I saw Hamilton on Broadway quite a few years ago um, with half of the original cast. And in the lead up to that night, which was a hideously expensive ticket for a very bad seat in the theater, I think that like literally for a whole year, the only musical sounds that I listened to through my headphones was Hamilton. I listened to Hamilton and only Hamilton, uh, all the songs in the, in the show. Yeah, that was it. That was it for a year. So I, I'm just, I'm such a fan of Lin-Manuel Miranda. So please get him. <laughs> Thank you. 
Carl Honoré is the face of the slow movement and a global leader in the growing crusade to get us all to have a more joyous approach to ageing. His choice leads to a compelling explanation about the pleasures and benefits of sketching. The fifth and final choice on Five My Life is, is often my favourite. It's the possession. People tend to get quite personal with this. And you've chosen an art pencil wrap. Could you tell us uh, why? But could you describe it first? It's a gift from my, my wife. It's a kind of canvas wrap that folds over. It probably wraps up sort of three times. And then there's a little buckle on it. You open it up and it just splays out an array of pencils and little charcoal pieces and a couple of erasers and so on. Uh, the kind of thing that artists would have used, you know, for, for decades, centuries, possibly in different forms. I really struggled at first, actually. It was funny when you asked to, for me to choose a possession. I, my first reaction was like, how am I going to do that? Well, do I pick a hockey stick? I, I'm just so uninterested in possessions. And whenever that dinner party parlor joke or question comes up, what would you save if you were running out of your burning house? I, I can never really think of anything because I don't, there's just nothing that I couldn't replace that I cherish that much as an object, to be honest. And then I thought, well, actually, I probably would reach for my canvas art pencil bag because it's got so many good associations. There's little nicks on it and it's not as clean and tidy as it was before because it's lived along with me. And I'd want to remember some of those little, little traces that have been left behind and feel its heft and its, its weave again in my hand. And I'm not an artist by any stretch of anybody's imagination. I'm terrible at drawing. In fact, it's a, it's a kind of family joke how bad I am at drawing. But I love drawing, right? I love sketching. And it, it ties into really what I suppose in some ways what many people have called my life's work, which is the idea of slowing down. And what, what sketching does, what drawing an object does, is that it forces you. It invites you, but it also forces you to do something that very few of us ever do nowadays in this media-drenched, multitasking culture of distraction and instant gratification, which is it forces you to pause, be still, and to look and observe at one thing, right? To be present in a way that I think very few of us manage to do nowadays. And so for me, it's the ultimate act of slow with a capital S. It's a kind of meditation. And I find that I don't often draw things that anybody would ever want to look at, but it's just the moment. It's about shifting into a different mode, a different way of being. It's like slipping in a chip into your head and blocking out the sound and fury that swirls around us in daily life of distraction and stimulation and saying, I am going to be here in this moment now, and I'm going to inhabit it and feel it out and make sense of it fully. And and so I, I, Take, I don't take it everywhere with me. And sometimes I just have a pencil and I, in my pocket and I'll do a little sketch. But I know that when I reach for that canvas bag, just to feel the rough texture of it in my hand, I know I can feel that I am on my way to a moment of serenity, to a place of tranquility, to a kind of reconnection with myself and, and the world around me. And I know that I'm going to open it out, choose a pencil, and the rest of the world is just going to melt away into insignificance and background nothingness and i'm just going to be you you can't be speeding up and distracted by distraction and multitasking if you're trying to get the angle of that roof correct you you just have to patiently observe and zone in there's a kind of simplicity and minimalism about drawing as well that it comes down just simply to you the pencil and the line that you're trying to capture and i think in a world of spiraling complexity and constant distraction. That is such a bomb, isn't it? <laughs> such a gift just to switch into that very simple mode. And when, it, when all the work I do with slow, people so often say they come to it via minimalism or simplicity, the simplicity movement that it's about paring back, getting to the core of things, uh, stripping away the fluff and the filler in getting to the heart of the matter. Uh, are, are you an optimist, mate? I mean, I, in, in my life, I, 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 I think uh, I, well, my wife would say I'm too slow, but I, I, I don't buy into this. The whole point of life is going ever faster. But, but how do you think we're going generally? Is society getting on board with slow or are you an outlier? I'm less and less an outlier. I definitely was at the beginning. I felt like a voice in the wilderness. 
but I don't feel like that now. I just saw just one little data point here to share. I saw the other day that uh, Google and YouTube had crunched the numbers looking at the number of views of videos on YouTube with the words slow living in the title. And over the last year, the number of views has gone up 400%. So I think it's just a reminder that this pandemic, which forced us to put on the brakes, uh, has operated, I think, for a lot of people like a like a giant workshop in slowness, right? And, and of course, that doesn't mean that I welcome the pandemic. It's been a total nightmare for, for all of us in different ways. But I do think there's a silver lining here that we've been forced to slow down long enough now that many of us have tasted the silver lining. We've seen that, that less is more, that FOMO is absurd, that there is great magic and music to be had by, by slowing down, by being present. And I, I think that that is something that, that's a kind of, lesson that a lot of people I think will take forward from the pandemic. So I was optimistic about the prospects for the slow revolution before the pandemic. I'm even more optimistic now. I think that at the granular individual level, people are waking up to the folly of living in fast forward, trying to reconnect with their inner tortoise in lots of different ways. But I think also globally that the pandemic has been a moment to, to reset, reboot the world. And you're already seeing new ways of thinking about uh, the role of the state, uh, the environment, uh, changing the way cities are structured so there's more space for cyclists, for instance, and, and pedestrians. So I, I think that the dial was already moving in favor of slow before. I think it will move <laughs> more quickly um, in the years to come. If, um, delicious irony there, but um, one to be embraced. I think your work, not just on slow, but on parenting, on ageing, it is sensational, mate. You are a real powerful force for good globally, and it's been just a delight to chat to you. There is one further trick question on Five of My Life. Uh, Who would you like to hear on Five of My Life next, Carl, and why? I'm going to say this with slight apprehension and mixed feelings, but maybe Elon Musk... Great. And why would you want to hear um, Musk's five? I disagree with him about so many things, <laughs> but I do find him a oddly enthralling figure. And so much of what he does seems to be aimed at the public arena. And then other times it seems wildly unfiltered. And I, I guess I just from curiosity, I'd like to peel back the facade and, and get a sense of What's driving this person who has, by various means, placed himself in a hugely pivotal place in modern life and, and, and is, is massively influential. So I think it would be useful for us to know more about what makes Elon Musk tick. Challenge accepted. We will uh, start the hunt as of tomorrow morning. Um, Carl, this has been a, a total joy. I, I, I've been looking forward to this for, for weeks and thank you for, for coming on. Um, and I wish you all love and success with your important work in the future. Thank you so much. It's been a, it's been a treat. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you follow Five of My Life, you might enjoy my latest book, Smart, Stupid and Sixty. In it, I write about a number of the issues discussed on the show. It's the 20-year follow-on from my first book, Fat, Forty and Fired. If you have any feedback on the book or suggestions for the show, please get in touch via my website, nigelmarsh.com.